Uh, Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3, if you would. Proverbs chapter 3. Um, We've gone through Proverbs in our Sunday school hour, and I want to talk a little bit about Proverbs chapter 3, beginning in verse uh, 33. Now, it's Father's Day, and uh, from time to time I will preach a message just to to fathers. Um, I know... Uh, years ago when I first started, like I, I think I have a sermon that's you know, three ways to be a good father and have successful children. Now I have three daughters and I have three ways to maybe be an okay dad and hope your kids come out, oh, well, who knows, <laughs> right? So, uh, but uh, look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13. Now, Proverbs is a wisdom book and it's uh, a proverb is a short kind of pithy saying, but it's supposed to have a, a truth to it that you can apply to your life, right? So uh, when, when we look at Proverbs, each of these kind of stands by itself. But look, look down to verse 33, if you will. Proverbs chapter 3, beginning in verse 33. There's a Bible in the back of the pew there. If you don't have one, you're certainly welcome to use it. Uh, Proverbs 3 and 33, it says, the, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Towards the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. Towards the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, God, that we could understand it and apply it. Um, Lord, I ask that, Lord, you'd move any hindrances that keeps us from hearing you speak through your word. Speak to our hearts and our minds, Lord. I ask, Father, that uh, we would leave here changed because your word has had its way in our minds and our hearts. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Now, he notice that he's going to give you these two uh, juxtaposed wicked and righteous. Wicked and right. Now, how do you define wickedness or how do you define righteousness? Well, um, wickedness is simply not knowing the Lord. Wickedness are those that, that don't know the Lord. Uh, the, the Bible says that, that each one of us has gone our own way that we've sought our own way, that that our hearts are wicked, that we choose our our own path. Uh, Look here when it says uh, that the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. So wickedness, if wickedness is not knowing the Lord, can you be religious and still be wicked? Can you be? Some of you are not so sure. Well, if we look in, in... The Bible over back in 1 Samuel, when it talks about Eli, Eli has two sons. Eli is the high priest. Uh, He is the religious leader of all of Israel. He has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And maybe they turned out bad because he named them that. I don't know. Why would you name your kids Hophni and Phinehas? But he did. And so it says in uh, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 2 and verse 12, it says this, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. And they did not know the Lord. Some translations say, now the sons of Eli were wicked men and they didn't know the Lord. They would take the offerings that the people brought to the Lord and they would would take for themselves what they wanted. And their father wouldn't discipline them. It was known all through Israel that they were wicked men. They're supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the country. They're supposed to be setting the tone. And yet they're wicked. Why? Why? Well, even though they're going through all the religious rites, they knew how to do everything. They knew when to say this and when to stand for that and when to bow your head for here. And even the prayers to say, it says they didn't know the Lord. You see, anyone who doesn't know the Lord is wicked. Wickedness is simply what we are on our own. You don't have to teach your kids to be bad. Amen? Even grandkids can be bad without being taught. Amen? I didn't know if Rhonda would amen me or not on that one. They've got a new grandbaby. So if wickedness is simply not knowing God, not walking with God, not serving the Lord through a relationship with Him. Now understand, Hot Nine Phineas, they were serving the Lord. They worked in church. But they were wicked. 
So we have a wickedness problem in our country and in our world. Amen? Amen. We have a wickedness problem, and, and that is that we don't know God and we don't follow God. We may give lip service to God, but as in general, as, as a country and even as a world, we don't fear God and we don't serve Him. Just like Hopna and Phineas. Now, it says that the, the, the home of the wicked is cursed, but the, the dwelling of the righteous will be blessed. Well, what is righteousness? Well, righteousness is simply trusting in the Lord. Now, hold your place there in Proverbs. And I want you to see this with your own eyes. Flip over to Romans. It's in the New Testament. Romans chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 3. What is righteousness? If wickedness is not knowing God, what is righteousness? Well, some of you guys are really quick on the uptake. That's right. It's knowing God, isn't it? But how do we know God? Look what it says in Romans chapter 3. And look at verse 21. Now, some of you may know verse 23. Some of you may have memorized that. Does anybody know that? For all have sinned and fall short the glory... Mm, that's right. How many have sinned? See, wicked people sin. You sin. I don't sin because I'm not wicked. But you sin. Wait, what? Now, what does it say? All have sinned in false word. I sin, right? In fact, if I tell you I don't sin, that's a sin, which means I... Never mind. But look at verse 21. Now, the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, Although the, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So how does someone become righteous? Well, they trust Jesus. Look what it says in verse 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For, for who? All who what? All who place their trust in. All who believe, right? But understand that it's a personal relationship. Can your parents believe for you? No. Can your spouse believe on your behalf? Can you give them the power of attorney? If you're on your deathbed and in a coma, they can say, Lord Jesus, please save me. Amen. And then sign up your name? Does it work that way? No. The wicked who are estranged from God, who don't, don't have a connection with God, and the righteous, what, what separates them is simply that they have come into a relationship, a faith-saving relationship with Jesus. It's not that they know who Jesus is, but it's they believe in Jesus. They've put their trust, we would say, in Christ. There's a difference between knowing something and believing something. Amen? I mean, I've watched a lot of TV during this lockdown stuff. And uh, I know when James and I were on a mission trip in Brazil, he watched enough of the... Uh, he was handing out eyeglasses and doing stuff. And he told me he brought his good pocket knife and he was ready to do eye surgery. <laughs> James, I've watched enough of the, the medical channels. I can probably assist now, Right? Because I know what you're supposed to do, so that would make me a great eye surgeon, right? Anybody want to volunteer? Yeah, no, right? Why? Because there's a difference between knowing something and believing something and trusting in and having experience with. Amen? So what's the difference between being wicked and righteous? It's that you have an experience with Jesus and that you've trusted in Him. Not just knowing who He is by name, but trusting in Him and what He's done on the cross and what He alone has done for your salvation. Then God declares you righteous. Now, if you're wicked or if you're righteous, there's two results of that. Look what the text, go back to Proverbs, flip back over. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but He blesses the dwelling of who? Hmm. What's the difference between a curse and a blessing? What is a curse? Now, when you think of curse, I don't mean curse words, right? Like taking the Lord's name in vain or something. What is a curse? Well, a curse is that God's judgment falls upon you. And a blessing is that God's favor falls upon you. Just a simple definition. 
So if the wicked, because they don't know God, and because they haven't trusted in Christ for salvation, and they're, they're living life on their own or doing it uh, whatever they see best, they've received, they'll receive a curse for not trusting the Lord. But if you trust the Lord, you'll receive a what? A blessing. But is that fair? Who should decide whether we're cursed or blessed? Guess who gets to decide whether you're blessed or cursed today? God does. And who else? You. In Deuteronomy chapter uh, uh, chapter uh, 4, excuse me, chapter 11, it says this. See, I'm setting before you, this is, this is Moses the prophet speaking, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commands of the Lord, your God, which I command you today. And the curse, if you don't obey the commands of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today and go after other gods that you have not known. So what is a curse? A curse comes upon those who don't choose the Lord. They choose to go after other gods. Now, there's individual faith, and there's cursing and blessing on individuals, there's also cursing and blessing on societies, countries. Uh, there's a blessing and curse on, uh, on churches, on, uh, on uh, businesses, uh, on families, right? So, so in this case, he's talking about a, a cursing or blessing. What, what do you think right now is going on in the United States? Do you think we're being blessed or cursed? Cursed? Watch the news and you sure think so, right? The easy answer is just quit watching the news. That's what I've done. Um, a curse comes when we, we don't recognize who God is. And as Moses said, when we don't choose to follow his commandments, when we don't do it God's way, but we do it our way, when we know better, right? So as a society, we're having trouble today. And part of the trouble is, well, let me tell you, if, if you want to guarantee that things turn out bad, then what you need to do is destroy the family. Because the family is the building block of every government, every society. It's the family, right? And by family, I mean a father, a mother, children, right? That's God's design. Listen to these statistics. Ask, let me ask you, is this home cursed or blessed? In this home, 90% of the children, 90% uh, of homeless children are this. 90% of homeless children have this. 85% of behavior problems are found in children of this. 71% of high school dropouts have this in common. 75% of youth in drug abuse centers have this in common. 85% of youth in prison have this in common. What do you think they have in common? No father in the home. No father in the home. So when we don't obey the Lord's commands and when we say, well, God, we know better. When we, when we say, God, as a society, we don't think we need fathers or we don't need mothers that you really haven't called them to a ministry in the home. That's not important. See, when you take a dad out of the home, 70, 90% of homeless children, no the, the number one indicator of poverty in the United States doesn't matter the race, doesn't matter, uh, doesn't matter uh, the, the background from immigration or any of that. What matters is, is there a dad in the home? Isn't that interesting? Black, white, red, yellow, Whatever, no dad in the home, number one indicator of poverty, no dad. Hmm. Do you think dads might be important? I wish somebody had told us that. Oh, wait, what does the scripture say? Right? Fathers have a responsibility to minister and to lead. Now, what happens when you don't have dads that stand up or men that stand up and, and be men in the home. And let me say likewise, uh, you, if you take the mom out of the home, you're going to have problems as well, right? But in this case, we have over 75% of African Americans uh, born today will not have a dad in the home. Some of the trouble that we see in the African American community um, they say, well, it's because we've been cursed because of slavery. 
And can I, can I say something? I, I've never been a, a slave, except for when my mother made me do all those chores. But let me ask you a question. Is something that happened 400 years ago or 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, will that affect you? Well, yes, it can affect you. But what affects a person more? The decisions they make in this life right now or the decisions that their great-great-grandparents had made or made for them? What do you think? When you stand before God in heaven and he says, why should I let you into heaven? Is he going to ask what your grandfather, your grandmother, were, were they believers? Let me tell you what, when I talk to folks, and they find, oh, you're a preacher? My grandfather was a preacher. I don't know, there must have been a... a preacher population explosion at some point because everybody have you noticed that brother Phil everybody's related to somehow right and I ask him well now what are you going to tell God when when you stand before him and he says why should I let you into my heaven and and they always say well my grandfather was a preacher and I'm thinking okay that's what you're going with you see salvation happens one heart at a time when Jesus came he said he was bringing in the kingdom, right? He was building the kingdom of God. But how does he bring the kingdom of God? Did he come and set up a, a new Jerusalem there in Jerusalem and throw out the Romans and do all the things they wanted? No. He did something they didn't understand. He made people trust in him one heart at a time. So what's the problem? What's the answers in our nation? Well, one of the answers is that we need to encourage dads to be in the home. Amen? Amen black, white, or what have you. Can I, can I tell you something? Whatever you're seeing in the African-American community, we're about 25 years behind in the Anglo community. So the population of Wills Point is mostly Anglo still, majority Anglo. But how many dads are in the homes? How many biological fathers are raising their biological children? I don't have statistics just for Will's point, but I have, I have some information. I, I know one of, our, uh, one of our teachers here in the church said that I, I think uh, that of the 22 students they had, there was only like three. Did I get that right? Am I, I'm looking at Kelly. She didn't even know I was going to do it. Is that, is that roughly right? It was like three out of 22 or something. John, actually, I got it from John. He talked, sorry. But... Only, there were only three kids who had the same biological father raising them. You think that makes a difference? Sure. Now, does that mean that a stepfather or being adopted? No, of course, adoption is wonderful. The stepfather's great. But if the stepfather or the boyfriend switches every six months, is that great? No. And where, where do children learn what it means to be masculine, because women need to know, children, young ladies need to know it, young men need to know. They, we, we catch it from modeling mostly, right? Interesting study, they had um, a problem in uh, Africa about seven years ago in a, uh, where they had a, a, an elephant preserve. Um, poachers had gotten in and had taken the last bull elephant, which is the male that dominates the herd. And so after that was done, they noticed in a few months that they were having rhinoceroses and uh, other animals that were gored and trampled and killed that just randomly they found. And what they found was there were rogue elephants. The young elephants didn't have any male role models. And so they were, they were running around, and because they were bigger, they would kill other animals just for the fun of it. You thought only people did crazy things like that, huh? they realized what happened was there was no bull elephant to teach the younger elephants what it meant to be a bull elephant, the other younger males. So they, they brought in a bull elephant and all of those killings stopped. Why? Because he taught them we don't do that. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And this is what it means to be an elephant. Now, if elephants need an elephant to teach them how to be a good elephant, what do you think people need? Probably good people, right? The wicked have a curse on their home. 
But those who know Christ and trust him have a blessing. And they, they receive that blessing from God. If you trust Christ, does that mean that you'll, have perfect, you'll be a perfect parent? Not everyone has a perfect father growing up like I did. My dad's here this morning. <laughs> Lord, forgive me if lightning strikes, right? My dad wasn't perfect. I won't go into details, right? Unfortunately for him, I wasn't a perfect kid either, so it worked out, right? I, I can remember the one time getting a whipping and dad realized that he had whipped me for something I hadn't done. And he said, man, I, it's the only time I ever remember dad apologizing for spanking me. And he said, I, I'm sorry, I, I thought you had done something. And, and, uh, I, and I said, oh, that's okay. I figured I probably hadn't gotten away with enough stuff that it evened out. You know, I didn't tell him that at the time. But, you know. so, uh, but here's the thing. God has set up a way for societies to function. And when we tell, when society tries to go another way other than God's plan, what's the result? It's a breakdown of society, right? And it doesn't matter the color. It doesn't matter whether they're black or whether they're Hispanic or whether they're Anglo. If we don't have men in the home and we don't have moms in the home that teach children to fear the Lord, then we lose our society. We need dads and we need moms. Amen? And so what you're seeing in our society now will not get better. It will only get worse. I, I, uh, I, I, notice what the, well, look at the scripture. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Towards the scorners, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor. Now, what does it mean to be scornful? Well, scornful means you just don't listen or you mock or, you know what scornful is, right? <laughs> right? Like the Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl. Right? Hey, they've got a good chance. They haven't lost anything yet. So, when he says that the scornful, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor. What does it mean to be scornful? It means to say that I know better than God and we can do it this way. And do you know that even believers can get sucked into that? So the problems that we have now in society, can they be fixed? Because I think what is interesting, have you noticed the kneeling thing going on where people are kneeling now before black people? And, and to, to show their repentance? Now here's the thing, racism is a sin, amen? But the Bible says that no, no child will be punished for his father's sin. We don't do that, do we? So... Should you be punished for your grandparents' sin? But now, so what is what is Car what what is your heritage? What's your what's Carter? Uh, German. Is, oh, it's German. German. Okay, you're oh Hessians, great. Yeah, we had a good run in with them at the American Revolution. So, and Alfred is English. All right. So, the Germans have invaded. Or, uh, and started two world wars, right? Just in the last couple centuries. Um, they've really given, given England, I think, so your, your relatives, family members, way back, and even some that may have probably, should you go and apologize to Phil for that? Maybe. <laughs> is, is that your fault? And if Phil's just going to be angry about those lousy krauts who did that, is, is, hey, I'm a kraut too, so I can say it, right? So, does that help anything as far as reconciling a relationship between Phil and Nelson if he says, hey, I'm sorry that my family, you know, great-great-grandfather, you know, shot down your grandfather in a triplane and, you know, right, Baron Von Carter, and right, does that help, or does that just distract from what the real problem? Because if Phil and Nelson have a problem, could it be that it's their own sin natures that they need to get right before the Lord and right before each other, and it, and their background doesn't have anything to do with that? Yeah, I think that's it. Now let me say something, and I've said this last Sunday. I preached on getting the the 
the beam out of your eye and helping the other get the speck out of their eye, right? Racism is a sin and hate is a sin. And you've got that in there, you need to get it out. But I know of no government program, I know of no way other than the Lord convicting each individual heart for that to happen. That's how it happened for me, right? So, you're English and I forgive you, Phil, because even though half of me is German, the other half is Irish, and we've been persecuted by the, by the English. You have burned our houses. Um, you have invaded our land. You took away, you made it illegal for us to speak Gaelic, uh, to even, uh, you guys have seen River Dance, right, where they, they do all the whatever. No, I'm not going to dance in church. But the, the goal of river dance is that from here down, everything's moving from here up. You can't tell. Why? Because the British made it illegal for the Irish to dance. So they, they would dance like this and you couldn't see through the window. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Phil, I forgive you. That's why I can't dance. It's your fault. <laughs> now, you're laughing because it's silly, right? But the world buys into that, don't they? Do you know what it is? It's a distraction. It's a distraction from what the problem really is. The problem is wicked hearts who don't acknowledge God. Of first, their own sin. See, the best way to make the world a better place is to make yourself a better person, and that's knowing Jesus as Savior and Lord and following Him. Amen? Because I said before, nobody can be saved for somebody else. You have to trust in the Lord. We need to pray for our country. And we need dads in the homes. And we need to realize, can I tell you just one thing in closing? Dads, you're so important. But you need to remember that dads aren't perfect. Amen? My dad wasn't perfect, but that's okay. You know what? If he was perfect, would I need a Savior like Jesus? I wouldn't need one. If he was perfect, how would I deal with my own imperfections? Oh, well, if, if, if I felt like he was perfect and I, I wasn't, then I, see how there's just condemnation there? But there's conviction from the Lord. You're imperfect, but I can fix you and make you like you should be. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Do you not know that the, the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? And such were some of you. And it goes on down in verse uh, 11. It says that you were washed... You were changed. You were, you were redeemed by who? Jesus. That's what you were. You were wicked and you can become righteous. That's the gospel, isn't it? That we were wicked, but we can be righteous. We just have to take responsibility for ourselves and ask the Lord, God, and, and, and admit, Lord, I can't fix myself. Now, what keeps people from trusting in the Lord is simply pride. They want to fix it themselves. And until you're desperate enough to realize, I'm so messed up, I can't fix myself. But for some reason, God still wants me. That's when the wicked become righteous. And that's when fathers become dads. That's when mothers and fathers in a home, when they know the Lord Jesus and they can be filled up with his love can make a difference in kids' lives. The best way I, that I know to change society is to, to search your heart and get right before the Lord. So my question for you is this. We can watch what's on TV and we can say, well, what they're doing is terrible and that's bad and I agree with this and I don't agree with that. But what about you? What's God doing in you? Are you right with him? Not to repeat last Sunday, but have you got the beam out of your own eye? Have you changed from being wicked to righteous, from being cursed to blessed? You just have to not scorn the Lord and just be humble. That last verse says, but he, he gives grace to the humble. Isn't that great? He gives grace to the humble. Humility is just saying, God, you're right. I'm not. Help me.